all things wise and wonderful you are in my darkest night you brighten up the sky song will rise I will sing a song of love sing along God of heaven come down heaven come down just to know that you are near is enough God of heaven come down heaven come down all things new and I can start again Creator God calling me your friend sing and praise my soul to the maker of the sky song will arise I will sing a song of hope sing along God of heaven come down heaven come Come down, oh sing a song of hope, sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven come down, just to know you and be loved is enough, God of heaven, come down, heaven come down. Sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven come down. Just to know that you are near is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven come down. Oh, sing a song of hope, sing along, God of heaven, come down, heaven come down. Just to know you and be loved is enough. God of heaven, come down, heaven come. Good morning, Hope Church First Service. Are you glad to be here today? I had to say that because Stan isn't here this morning, so, and he usually says that, so I had to fill for him. So if my announcements take more than 45 seconds, well then, suck it up. That's what it's going to be. Hey, listen, I got to tell you, we owe Barbara back there a, a, a hand of gratitude. We had... 30 people show up here Christmas night for Christmas dinner that she organized, and that's fantastic. That's what this building is for, is to use. And, and if you have something like she had a special event, it's yours. That's what it's all about. Next Saturday, men's breakfast. Who's going to be there? <laughs> come on now. All right. Put your hand down, girl. You can't come. Anyway, go ahead and sign up if you haven't. Um, on... Next, on January 12th, we're going to have another movie here in the afternoon after church, and it's going to be a Disney movie called Planes. I was kind of hoping it was going to be that John Candy movie, Trains, Planes, and Automobiles, but they didn't think it was good for the kids. But, <laughs> and maybe they're right. Who knows? Anyways, so if you have neighbors or kids and things like that you want to invite, you know, feel free to do that. That's kind of cool. We have a uh, special guest speaker today, somebody that's very close to us, dear and near. It's uh, Jeff Schock, and his wife is Stan's oldest daughter, Allie. Okay. Now, I have a special feeling for him because, one, he's a lot bigger than me, and he'll rip my arms off if I don't say things nice. Um, he's a uh, former Marine, and you know how I appreciate somebody that's serving our country. Thank you for serving our country, Jeff. That's an important thing. He's also an associate pastor at a church called Centerpoint Church in Long Island, New York. 
You know, I was surprised when I heard this because I honestly didn't know that New York, that there was a place called Long Island. I just thought that was a drink. I, I, was, I didn't know that there was more to it than that. Anyway, so it's kind of really neat to have that. Well, today is a tremendous day of celebration. Um, as, uh, if you were here last week, you saw Jeff's artwork up here and Stan preached. And if you were here at the beginning of second service, you saw a gal come in in a uh, push chair. That's Stan's mom. And so she got to spend days here with uh, her grandsons, her son. Both of her sons were here. Ron was here. That's the guy that was kind of had a shaved head. That's, that's Stan's brother. Anyway, uh, so she had a, a wonderful few days here, and then she went back down to Hansford, and she passed away yesterday morning. So what a way to celebrate. She's with the Lord now. And, I, and all I can say is I know that her and Walt are up there going, come on, come on, Tom, get on with it. But it's just so neat that she got to spend her last few days with uh, the family that she loves so dearly. So anyway, take a moment and greet somebody and be celebrating Stan's mother's time with the Lord. of going <laughs> Ah. Uh. 
I'm found was blind, but now I see you so clear.
The coming of Jesus was good news and great joy. And we can now live without fear because Jesus is God with us and he is our savior. In communion, we worship and adore our savior who took our sins upon himself on the cross and shed his blood for our forgiveness. Lose. 
that you did that you didn't expect to see me up here again, did you? Surprise. Well, Stan's always told me that he has one very favorite daughter-in-law, and that's Kate Friedis. <laughs> the one and only. One. It's his very, very favorite daughter-in-law. And she's also a member of a church in Minnesota and a part of the staff and does stuff, and she wants to sing for us this morning. So you've been introduced now. Perfect. Thank you. In a land far away, time stood still long ago. There were shepherds in fields, or at least this is how the story goes. The story goes. Woman with child and den in with no room. Born in a manger for telling the two, this is how the story goes. But it's more than a fable. And it's more than a fairy tale And more than my mind can conceive I believe the wise men saw The baby boy the angels called the Son of God Heaven's child, the great I am, born to take away my sin through nail-pierced hands, Emmanuel has come, I believe. Two thousand years, still the story lives on. God's gift to us, sent to earth, wrapped in flesh, his only son. His only son. And the heartbeat of heaven confounded our wisdom. But it's still the simple truth that set me free. I believe the wise men saw the baby boy the angels called the son of God. Heaven's child, the great I am, born to take away my sin through nail-pierced hands. Emmanuel has come, and I believe. Precious child.
checked. Wow, thank you, Kate. That was, that was great. Well, uh, as Tom told you, my name is Jeff. Uh, I am a pastor out on the East Coast near New York. It is not just a drink. There's an island there uh, that lives just past Manhattan, the big city. And um, I'm delighted to be sharing with you this morning. Uh, I feel like I'm channeling Stan a little bit this morning. I'm wearing his shirt. I'm, <laughs> I'm preaching at his church, and uh, it's been an emotional time for us. I feel a little emotional, and I lost my phone. So I feel like I've completely uh, channeled Stan. Um, we're doing kind of like a Christmas 2.0 today, aren't we? And uh, you know what? I mean, it's a great excuse to not have to get rid of the poinsettias just yet. But this story, the Christmas story is amazing. The, the entirety of scripture is punctuated by, by the birth of Christ, Emmanuel, God with us. It's, it's extraordinary. It's as if everything from Genesis all the way through Malachi, the entire Old Testament, was pointed to this. It's as if there's a big road sign saying something's coming, something's happening. There's this uh, this problem of sin and death, and and there's a God who's loved us and has not forsaken us to let us just kind of muck about on our own. He's going to do something. He's going to intervene. And the way he does it was something that nobody, nobody could have possibly foreseen. And then when it happens, all of a sudden it brings everything into focus for us. So to just simply blow through the Christmas season and have a, you know, have a kind of warm, fuzzy, hot chocolate experience and, and to, to miss this, uh, I, I does the, the Bible horrible this service. So I'm glad we get to spend a little more time here. Um, this morning, I want to I wanna teach out of Luke. And we're at the first chapter of Luke. And, and really, this is, you know, one of the uh, these really, uh, it's, it's probably the bi- biggest, largest account as far as how many words there are of the, the kind of Christmas story, the nativity, the angels showing up, showing up and all that. So I'm, I want to give you a little uh, background here in Luke 1. An angel appears to Zechariah in the temple. Zechariah is the husband of Elizabeth, who would be the mother and the parents of John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, right? So an angel of the Lord appears to Zechariah in the temple. And, uh, you know, he's, he's an old man. He's going to say, the angel tells him he's going to have a child. And... Uh, you know, Zachariah's response, it gets him in a little bit of trouble. He's like, he asks for a sign. And the angel obliges him and says, I'll give you a sign. You're not going to speak until that baby is born. Zechariah comes out of the temple just doing this. And, you know, he's trying to tell people what happened. They realize what happened. And, uh, and, and it's extraordinary. And just, just a little while later in the chapter, you're going to see a, a, a nearly identical experience happen to a very young girl named Mary. Now, Mary would have been about uh, 12 or 13 years old, because that's the age of a Jewish woman in that culture who was betrothed but not yet married. And something extraordinary happens to her. And I want to read you from Luke 1, 26. If you have your Bibles, you can read along with us. If not, I think the words are going to be on the screen. <clears throat> in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, greetings to you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I'm a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who is said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word be fulfilled in me. Then the angel left her. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And then Mary, 
launches into a song that's come to be called the Magnificat for the first words of the song in Latin. And I'm not going to read it all free, and I'd encourage you to read it uh, later on. But she starts it, she says, and Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has been mindful of this humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. And she goes on, and, and uh, this song has endeared Mary. Mary does not get a lot of lines in the Bible, you might have noticed, but this, this right here, this is, this is pretty much all we get from Mary. But this song has endeared her to millions and millions of people for thousands and thousands of years. And really, what happens here, what you see Mary saying, this is nothing short of a conversion experience. Mary, in this proclamation, when she hears Elizabeth say, uh, who am I to be so favored uh, that the mother of my Lord would come see me? Did you hear the mother of my Lord? For a Jewish person to, to say this was like just unconscionable. You have an entire culture, an entire race of people that had been raised from childhood to believe that there was no way that God could be a man. And all of a sudden she is, she's saying exactly that. And something clicks for Mary. She, you see just before that, she's, uh, she's, she's kind of, uh, she's blown back. The angel shows up to her and says, um, you know, you're going you're gonna to conceive. And then she's like, how, how will this be? Which is a fair question. And all of a sudden, she goes from uh, being um, kind of like skeptical, maybe not having all the answers, not understanding the logistics of how this is all going to work out. And then, and then she goes on this journey. It would have probably been about three days to get to her cousin Elizabeth's house. And as she's going, this song is kind of kindling in her heart. And it bears a striking similarity to a song in the Old Testament that Samuel's mother writes when she's pregnant with him. And you can read that in 1 Samuel chapter 2. But she composes this song. And when, when she sees Elizabeth and she hears Elizabeth, Elizabeth call her the mother of my Lord, something erupts within her. And, and she sings this song. And this is a blueprint for us. This, this will show you what it means to become a Christian. It will show you what it means to become a Christian. Mary becomes the first Christian in her admonition, in her proclamation, and it's extraordinary. I want to I wanna share a little bit from my own experience. I wasn't always a Christian. I, I grew up in New York on Long Island, and uh, that, that area is very, uh, uh, it's very, well, nobody goes to church. I'll just say it like that. It's uh, everybody, people are just jaded and skeptical and ornery, and everything that you think you know about New York is just totally true. And, uh, and so I grew up there, you know, as jaded, skeptical New Yorker, and I was an atheist. I had grown up Catholic, and I left my faith, um, what little semblance of a faith I had in junior high, and uh, I became an atheist, and I stayed that way, and uh, I joined the Marines at 19, and I got out, and I moved to Los Angeles, and uh, there were some people in my life, God providentially put people in my life that challenged my thinking. They challenged my presuppositions. So I, I always considered myself a fairly ordered thinker, and I thought, there's no way I can believe this. This is an agrarian fairy tale and a crutch for weak-minded people and so on. And, um, but the, God put some people in my life that challenged that, and so I thought, I made a decision about this, but I was very young. I was probably in junior high when I, when I had come to this conclusion. So I thought, it's, it's fair that I revisit this through the lens of an adult understanding, right? And, and I, I did reason, and I want, I want to share this with you. If, if you don't take anything else away, maybe you walked through the doors this morning, someone dragged you here. Um, the most important question that any of us will ever ask or answer is, is the question that this passage raises right? Is it, are the Christian claims true? It's the most important, regardless of how you answer it. If you, if you say, no, I don't believe them. I'm going to dismiss it all. It's a crutch, and, and it's just fanciful thinking for, for people who are afraid to die. If you dismiss it, it absolutely is the most important question you're going to ever, ever ask or answer, because how you answer it has the most profound ramifications for the rest of your life, where you live, how, who you love, how you love them, what you spend your money on, what you spend your time on, everything it's impacted by this question. So I reason that this is the most important question anyone's ever going to ask or answer. And so I should probably revisit it through the lens of an adult understanding. And there are a couple of serious obstacles for me that I had to overcome in my conversion experience. And uh, principally, they were the existence of God, right, in general, and the Christian claims specifically, right? 
And, uh, you know, for me, and I, it's, a conversion experience is not a static, it, it'd be great if it were like, here's three things you do, and then just something happens. There's people in this room, I'm sure if we pulled you, you were in your car one day at a stoplight, you were playing racquetball, you were gardening, something happened, you were having a conversation with a friend, or, or maybe you were sitting on your parents' lap years and years ago, and something clicked for you. There's no standard kind of conversion experience, but I know personally I had to come to a place where my brain would let my heart go. I had all these, I had, you know, you watch enough Discovery Channel and you hear, you know, those kind of theories out there that this is all just an accident and we're just the kind of, the accidental convocation of molecules and this all just kind of worked together and um, you hear a lot of that. So I had to come to a place where my brain would let my heart go. And maybe that's you. Maybe you have uh, some kind of skepticisms in your heart and, and you've been doubtful about this. So I, I just want to briefly share uh, a couple of things that were important to me on my journey. And uh, I, we talked about the existence of God. You know, there's a lot of people out there that would have you believe this is just all happenstance. It's a complete accident. And, um, well, there's, uh, there's a theory out there, and I'm just going to talk about it real briefly, and you can Google it later if you want to know more, but it's called fine-tuning. It's called fine-tuning. And, and, and this is something that astrophysicists uh, like to talk about, and the uh, metaphor they frequently use is, it's as if there are literally millions of these little dials, these little dials in the universe, right? And they're all adjusted perfectly, just perfectly, so that life will exist. And I'm just going to give you a couple examples out of literally millions. There's something called the cosmological constant, which is something to do with the relationship between, uh, between gravitational and electromagnetic force. Now, if this, if this ratio were off by just one part in 10 to the 400th power, I got a number here. What's that number? That one. So it, if it were off by just that fraction, matter would not adhere. There would be no life in the universe. There would be no planets, no stars. It wouldn't happen, right? Now, there's a, a, a professor by the name of Paul Davies. He's a professor of physics at Arizona State, and he said this. He said, that is the kind of accuracy a marksman would need to hit a coin at the far side of the observable universe 20 billion light years away. So that's, that's just one example, that things are perfectly, to the smallest integer, completely fine-tuned to make life possible. And everybody will tell you, well, how could this possibly have happened by accident? And here's another one. The Earth rotates on an axis of 23 and a half degrees. Did you know that? I don't know if you knew that. But the Earth rotates on an axis of 23 and a half degrees. It varies three degrees, either way, every six months, because we have a rather large moon for a planet our size. And that's what gives us our seasons, right? And so if this particular axis, if this particular axis were off by just three or four percent, life wouldn't exist on our planet. The reason we have such a large moon is because one day an asteroid was flying through space. This is what astrologers and astrophysicists believe. An asteroid was flying through space and it got stuck in Earth's gravitational pull and just started essentially doing this. And that's why we have our seasons. That's why life is possible. Here's something else. The Earth is 93 billion miles from the sun, million miles from the sun. And if we were just 5% closer, we would all burn up. If we were 5% further away, the earth would freeze. It wouldn't support life. If the earth's crust were just 10 feet thicker, all the oxygen in the atmosphere would oxidize and it wouldn't support life. If it were 10 feet thinner, there, uh, there wouldn't, it, there, the earth's Temperature would be too hot. If our oceans were 10 feet deeper, there'd be too much carbon in the atmosphere. It wouldn't support life. There are literally millions and millions and millions of these dials. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because maybe you're sitting there and you're like I was, and you want to just dismiss, just dismiss the Christian claims. And you're like, oh, it's just fanciful, wishful thinking for people. I have to tell you, there, there are very good arguments. And, I, and regardless of whether you're, uh, whether you're a Christian or not, all of us are people of faith. All of us are people of faith. You can choose to believe that, that the universe happened by accident. We are the accidental convocation of molecules. Or you can choose to believe that this actually was a plan and somebody did adjust things in just the right way. But in any case, we're all people of faith. Those are both faith positions. And you have to recognize that. Now, the next thing I want to talk about is the Christian claims in particular. The Christian claims in particular. They're extraordinary. They're They're extraordinary. Can we just be, be plain for a second here? Angels showing up, virgins giving birth, the dead being raised, people walking on water, seas parting. 
the Christian claims are unbelievable. They're extraordinary. And so I know, I remember looking at them with a great deal of skepticism. And I had to, uh, I had to come to a place where I could reconcile um, these claims and, uh, and come to a place where I, I, I felt like they were plausible so that my brain would let my heart, right? And I just want to share a couple of things real briefly on that front. Um, the Christian claims in particular, it, it, people get preoccupied with the Bible and they'll be like, did the Red Sea really part? Or was that just a metaphor for something? And, and people will, you know, they'll, they'll look at the miracles in the Bible and, and examine them one at a time. And if, if you're going to do that, and if you're, if you're skeptical about it, I would encourage you to investigate just one. Just one. Take a look at the empty tomb. The empty tomb of Jesus, right? He's, uh, he's, he's crucified under Roman rule, uh, and, and he's laid in, in a borrowed tomb. And all of that is historically verifiable, uh, extra-biblical sources. No, nobody's in disagreement about those events. What happens after that, however, is a faith position, and it's a very, very big deal. The Bible tells us that three days later, Jesus rose and walked out of that tomb. Now, if the tomb is empty, then the Bible's true, all of it, right? Jesus affirms the scripture. He says, uh, you know, he says, I haven't come to, to blot out the law, but to fulfill it. And he claims to be God. And then he's killed and laid in a tomb. And if it ended there, it would end there. But it doesn't. Something happens. Jesus walks out of that tomb. And the apostles the people who are closest to him, who were the eyewitnesses to these events, who by all, all accounts, if Jesus had stayed in that tomb, they were scattered, they were running, and they were scared. But something happened. That tomb is empty, and now these apostles, they come, they see the risen Christ. He appears to 500 people. And these, these boys, they were young, go on to live the most selfless lives. All of them, save one, giving, them, giving, their, giving their life in the service of this message. Now, if the tomb isn't empty, you have to explain this in another way. People will die for a lie, right? They will, terrorists will fly planes into buildings for a lie. Lunatics will walk into a nursery school with, with, with uh, weapons because they believe something and it's a lie. But you won't die for something you know to be a lie. And you, here you have 11, they had 12, Judas fell away. They had 11 of the closest eyewitnesses, the people who knew Jesus the best. Something happens. Jesus is crucified. He's laid in the tomb. They're scared. They're, they're scattered. And then something galvanizes their faith. Something, something happens and it kindles a fire within them. And they end up becoming the first missionaries. The gospel goes out from there. They plant churches. They live lives. And all of them are martyred for their faith. Except for John, they boiled him in oil and he lived. And then they, they exiled him on an island somewhere. So you have these men who live this selfless life. And would they, would they do that if the tomb were not empty? I've been trying to explain that in another way for a long time, and I can't. You have to come up with some other rationale that would explain th their conversion, really, their conversion. You know, all through the Gospels, they're like, who is this that has the power of the waves? Like, they were kind of, they were a little slow, and you even see Jesus at one point, how much longer must they suffer this unbelieving generation? And then, and then something happens within them, and there's no doubt left in them. Something ignites with them, just like Mary, a song kindles in their heart, and they go out from there, and the Christian message goes out from there, and in just a little over 300 years, it becomes the dominant faith system from the western shores of England all the way to the Himalayas. Something happened. You have to explain that. And I've been trying to do it for a long time, and I, I can't explain it in another way. It appears to me, looking objectively at the text, that the tomb is empty, that Jesus rose and he walked out of that tomb, and oh my gosh, you know what that means? That means it's all true. There's one more thing I want to, uh, it's kind of personal. Um, the conversion of a man named Saul meant a lot to me personally. Here you have somebody who's a skeptic, and you can read about in the book of Acts when they go to stone Stephen, the first Christian martyr, they go to stone, and what do they do? They lay their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. Saul was a rabbi. He was studying under another rabbi by the name of Gamaliel, who's like this uh, kind of head honcho in ancient Israel, if you will. And uh, he's on a management track. He's, uh, he goes on, he'll, he'll tell you about this in the New Testament. He says, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a Pharisee, Total, the, the religious elite. Uh, there, were, there were Sadducees and Pharisees and Essenes, but the Pharisees were the most pious, the most devout. Paul will tell you that. He's like, 
I was a Pharisee. As for zeal, persecuting the church. What had happened was after uh, the resurrection, they began persecuting these Christians because when you kill the leader of a movement, usually that guarantees that the movement, you know, kind of goes down with it. But what happened was when they killed Jesus, all these people started saying, no, we saw him, he's, he's alive, he's alive. And it, and it started this movement that frankly frightened a lot of the people that had, had put Jesus to death. So they commissioned Saul to take a contingent of temple guards to a, a city called Damascus to ferret out these Christian cells and, and kill the Christians. Right? On the way to Damascus, Paul gets struck blind. The risen Jesus appears to him, strikes him blind, and says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute? And he falls off his horse. And, uh, and it would be some time before he got his sight back, but Saul would become Paul. He gives us most of the New Testament. Uh, he's, he's, by any account, the, the most prolific missionary in all of history. And you have to explain Paul's conversion in another way. He went on. He didn't live a life of luxury after that happened. He went on to essentially be an outcast and a criminal. He went from being the, the religious elite on a management track uh, to, to being an outcast. He was flogged. He was thrown in prison. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten by snakes. He was arrested. He was persecuted. He, he lay starving in a prison cell. And eventually, as church tradition holds, his head lands at the bottom of a Roman basket. This man had nothing at all to gain. You have to explain his conversion somehow. And I've been thinking about that for a very long time. And it certainly appears, looking objectively at it, that the risen Lord Jesus did appear to Paul. And you've got to explain these things in another way. And perhaps you've dismissed the claims as just kind of wishful thinking. I, and you really haven't uh, done your due diligence in investigating these or, or even reading through them. I, I, and I don't mean to sound rude, but it's intellectual laziness. This is the most important question any of us will ever ask or answer. And, and, and just like me, if you can come to a place where your brain will let your heart go, um, you're going you're gonna to experience what Mary experienced. This, her song will tell you if you're a Christian. Whether, you, whether you've been going to church your whole life or this is your first Sunday walking through the door of a church, if, if, if your heart begins to stir like, like Mary's, She goes from skeptical and doubtful. She doesn't have all the answers. I don't really know exactly how this is going to work out, but I'm the Lord's servant. And and she's willing to step out in faith. Her response sounds a lot like Zechariah's response, where he's like, uh, you know, give me a sign, you know, but it's not. It's it's subtly different, and and that's really important for us because she's just saying, uh, she's saying, I'm the Lord's servant. Let your will be fulfilled in me. And so she's not asking for a sign. She's, she's just got a, a reasonable question. But then she says, I'm, I'm yours. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it's going to work. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take that very first step of faith. And then something happens within her. It's interesting. It wasn't just an all at once thing where this song erupts. She, she had to, to kind of marinate on it for a little while. And then she saw it. And then she saw it. She was the first one to see it. She became the very first Christian and a song erupts from within her. And that's how you'll know that you've been converted, that you're a Christian, because you had a song erupt in your heart at one point. You saw what God did. And you've got, you've got to know, that nobody expected God to come in person. That was, that was totally off the radar. You know, we can look back at the Old Testament, and it certainly seems like it was pointing there, but nobody was guessing that. And Mary realizes that God doesn't come as a conquering king. He comes as a baby in a manger, and he lives a pauper's life. And he doesn't lead a, lead a, a traditional rebellion or a coup like they wanted him to. He comes, and he preaches and teaches and heals the sick. He never traveled more than 90 miles from his birthplace. The only writing he ever did was in the sand. He never wrote a book or marshaled an army. Yet, this time of year, his birth is celebrated all over the world. And, and Mary was the first one to see it, that God loved us that much, that he gave his son, that he gave his son, and that he would, and that he would bear, that he would bear the price, that he would bear the debt that all of us incurred, because now, there's not one of us who hasn't sinned against other people and hasn't sinned against God. It's, it's a plain fact. Romans says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's everybody in this room is horribly in need of this grace he offers. And Mary's the first one to see it, and she sees what a big deal it is, and it is huge. It is huge for her. Do you see that? 
God found a way to destroy sin and death without destroying us in the process. And she recognizes that, and something ignites within her, and a song comes forth. It says, my soul rejoices. That's how you'll know you're a Christian. When you get to that moment, when you've seen that, that Jesus on the cross, he's hanging there for you. And if it were only for you, if you were the only person who would ever call on his name, he still would have come. He loves you that much. And when you see that, when you see how God intervened in history, intervened in the lives of, of people and places and how much he shaped events through that, oh, you, a song erupts, something kindles in your heart. And you see, that was for me. He loved me that much and how screwed up I am. Can you believe that? I tell you what, there's a, there's a, we talk about Mary being the first Christian. There's another first Christian, Graham, Stan's mom. And uh, she was the first Christian in that family. And she sowed seeds of faith uh, that now she's got kids, she had, uh, two sons and a daughter, Stan, his brother. Stan's brother uh, runs a missionary organization. He planted churches in Central and South America for the last 30 years. Stan has been a pastor for over 30 years now, and he's got four kids, and they all love the Lord. And, and, and now they're having kids, and those kids are, are, are getting... Uh, told and taught about Jesus and the gospel and what good news it was. And, and Graham was the first Christian in that family. And those of you that got to meet her, you knew there was just something about her. Her countenance, uh, she, she was the happiest, most peaceful, loving uh, person I think I've ever met, you know? And you could tell that she had seen it. She loves Jesus. And she had seen what he has done by God showing up at a manger as a baby, living a pauper's life and getting crucified as a criminal for you and for me, she saw it and something erupted within her and she had the peace that passes all understanding that Paul talks about in Philippians, the, that same peace that eludes most of us. But I'm telling you, when you get to a point where you can see fully what God has done, if you can see the enormity of your sin, right? If you can see the, if you could depict it visually, what would your sin look? I mean, it would be, I don't even want to think in personal terms. Um, but when you can see the enormity of what he did on that cross, that song's going to kindle within you. And you can live a life that absolutely defies convention. You can have a peace that passes all understanding. And you can, you can live to love people like Graham did. We had a sign that Zach and Kate made. And they put it on a tree when the, she just came up for the Christmas, you know? And uh, I said, welcome home, Graham. She wasn't quite home yet. But today she's home. <sighs> Maybe you've been looking for that for a long time. Maybe you've been coming to church for years and years and that's eluded you and you're like, I've never... I've never felt that joy kindle within me. Think today on that baby in the manger. Understand that he came for you. And he paid a debt and a price that you couldn't possibly pay on your own. And God sent him to destroy sin and death so that he wouldn't destroy us in the process. And you're going to feel a song kindle within you. And your life will never look the same. Let me pray. Lord, we, uh, Father, we pray to you for this story. Lord, we, uh, we praise you for Mary and what you did in her and through her. God, most of all, we praise you for your son, that you loved us so much, despite who we are, despite our shortcomings. God, we just, we thank you that you loved us so much to send your son, Emmanuel, God with us to show us the way home. Father, we just lift up uh, the Freitas family to you, and we ask that you would be with them and give them that peace. Lord, and we, uh, we know that you've welcomed Graham into your arms. We just praise you for what you've done in her life and the lives of all the people, the hundreds of people she's impacted over the years. God, we bless you for that. Father. In Jesus' name, amen.
God loves a lullaby and a mother's tears in the dead of night better than a hallelujah sometimes. God loves the drunkard's cry, the soldier's plea not to let him die, better than a hallelujah sometimes. We pour out our miseries, God just hears a melody. Beautiful the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts. How better than a hallelujah. woman holding on for life the dying man giving up the fight are better than a hallelujah sometimes the tears are shameful what's been done and the silence when the words won't come are better than a hallelujah sometimes We pour out our miseries, God just hears a melody. Beautiful the mess we are, the honest cries of breaking hearts. How better than a hallelujah, better than a church bell ring, better than a choir. just hears a melody beautiful the mess we are the honest cries of breaking hearts how better than a hallelujah cries of breaking hearts how better than a hallelujah how better than a hallelujah they're better than a hallelujah Well, I have to tell you, thank you, Kate, and thank you, Jeff. Give him a hand. That was pretty cool. That was pretty cool, both of you. Thank you very much. Well, now it's time to be happy for our offering. I like it. And if you would remain standing for our last song, remember what our purpose is building relationships that last forever. And how do we do that? By loving, pe uh, loving people. And remember, with Christ, we always have hope.
to you and look to you my blessed savior i surrender wrong Happy New Year. <laughs>